This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I invite you to stand and turn your attention back to the baptismal font as we listen to the sound of the pouring waters, reminding us that we are God's beloved, that God is well pleased with us, and that God has brought us here this day to worship and to praise. Let's join in our opening proclamation together. The words will be up on the screen. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. This very day, our God has acted. Let us rejoice. Alleluia. God's name be praised. Alleluia. As you might have noticed, I am not Daniel Steiner. That is right. Daniel Steiner is out this morning, which means you get just extra guitar and extra of me and Mary. The talented folks are still here, so don't worry. We're, we're, but uh, let's start this morning with Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. us thy humble dwell all thy faithful mercies crown jesus thou You may be seated and let us pray almighty god open our ears to hear your voice that in our hearing we may ever be ready to act and in our action we would love and praise you richly amen our psalter lesson for this day comes from psalm 62 verses 5 through 12 we will read this responsively together we'll sing a refrain and then all join in on the bolded text the words will be up on the screen He's given Jesus Christ, His Son, give thanks. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from Him. 
He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Give thanks with a grateful heart. He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks. Those of low estate are but a breath, those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion, and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord. For you repay to all according to their work. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. He's given Jesus Christ, his son, give thanks. Well, hello, Christchurch kids. Thank you, Kristen. That was extra lively this morning. Oh my goodness, what a joy to be with you all this morning. After three weeks being away, you just look even prettier than ever. What can I say? Um, So this morning, we're talking about Jonah. Now, how many of you have heard of Jonah before? Let's hear some hands. I see a lot of hands. And let me guess, if you've heard of Jonah, you've heard a story that goes something like this. Jonah heard God's call and didn't want to do it. So he got in a boat. And he went far away, but then a giant fish gobbled him up, and it took him right back to where he started. And then Jonah followed God's call anyway. Well, I love that story, and it's so cool. That's in the Bible, y'all. The Bible's a fun place. But one thing that we leave out of that story, why was Jonah running in the first place? I wonder... Why do you think Jonah was running from God's call? Well, the Bible actually tells us. Jonah tells God, I was running because I knew you were slow to anger and steadfast in love. Jonah was running because God loved so much? That's a real head-scratcher, isn't it? But I think the thing that Jonah was upset about was that God loved the people that Jonah didn't want God to love. You know, Jonah Jonah wanted God to love people that looked like him, people that acted like him, people that he thought were cool. Jonah wasn't crazy about God loving those other people. In this case, the Ninevites. Really, you know, bad folks. Think like the bully in school or camp or maybe even your meanest teacher you've ever had. Can God even love them? Well, God's answer is yes. So I want us to practice something this morning. It's a, it's a kind of meditation. So if when I said, can God even love that person, someone came to your mind, then think about that person for a second. Draw them to your mind. If you have anyone that you can think of that might just be a little hard to love, just draw them in your mind's eye. Don't say it out loud. Do not say it out loud. Okay? And I want you to try to imagine what God might love about them. What are some 
really good qualities that this person might possess, or what are some things that make this person special and beloved by God? Maybe if we can see in others what God sees in them, then the world can be a much better place. Will you pray with me? God, give us eyes to see the ways that you see, that we might love those who who we find it hard to love, that we might just not run away from your call to love others, but that we might run to it, and that we might love as you have loved us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right, so will all the kids who'd like to come out for the village meet me in the back, and we will get ready. Thank you, Brandon. Anybody who says the Bible is boring clearly has not read the story of Jonah. (laughs) Friends, our Old Testament lesson today comes to us from Jonah, one of the shortest books in the Bible. So if you can't find it, you may have just missed it. Uh, But it comes from Jonah. We're going to read both chapter 3 and 4. I promise that they are not that long. Let us hear now what God is seeking to say to us this day. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city. And proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. And when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne and removed his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in the ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal or herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth and they shall cry mightily to God. And all shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is it not this? Is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish in the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? And then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But then dawn came up the next day, and God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. 
our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, I said this last time, and I'll say it again. Pastor Ben is enjoying some vacation, so if this goes poorly, please come back next week. <laughs> I don't know what it is about the summer, uh, but I tend to lean really hard into musical soundtracks, um, sort of for my, my go-to music when I have to walk my dog. So, so many miles in this blistering heat. Um, I think we can all identify with Jonah in that part of the story, right? This has been a hot one this summer. I don't know if it's the Tonys happening in June or what it is, or if it, but whenever the temperature rises, so does my love of the Great White Way. I won't lie, I was very excited to get this text this week. I mean, you may have heard from Pastor Ben that this sermon series is all my fault. That is not true. We agreed on it together. <laughs> Pastor Ben, I hope you're watching this. It was not my fault. It was not at all my fault. But I was so excited to get this text because I've had the Hebrew midwives, had the daughters of Zelophehad, not easy text to preach. And I thought, oh, Jonah, this will be great. There's nothing remotely controversial about Jonah. Until I reread the text and thought, oh, dear. <laughs> the first character that came to mind as I was mulling over this text this week, poor Jonah and his wilted vine, is the character Javert from the behemoth musical Les Miserables. If you've not seen Les Mis, promise me that next time it comes to the Deepak that you will go. It's a great show. It's my dad's favorite musical, and he's not really much of a theater guy. So if he likes it, I feel like you will probably like it too. Anyway, a brief plot synopsis, if you can do that for Les Mis. Um, it's based on the book by Victor Hugo, and it follows the life of ex-convict Jean Valjean in the midst of the French Revolution, the later one, not the one with Marie Antoinette. Jean Valjean is thrown in jail for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family, and then he's let out of jail on parole. And he steals some candlesticks from a bishop who gives him housing, tears up his parole ticket, and thus violates his parole. Eight years later, he becomes mayor of a small French town and adopts the daughter of a dying woman he meets in the street and raises the child as his own, rescues her love interest who is shot on the barricade during that French Revolution, and like all great Broadway actors, dies after singing an exceptionally high note at the end of the musical. <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot. This Javert fellow, um, he's the warden who paroles Valjean at the beginning of the show. And Valjean is told that he must present his yellow parole ticket everywhere he goes to let people know that he's an ex-felon. But this ticket is causing him not to get hired anywhere because no one wants to hire an ex-con man. So Valjean tears up the ticket and the hunt is on. Javert spends practically the entire musical the entire musical, and it's a long musical, hunting down Jean Valjean. He confronts him at the deathbed of the dying Fantine whose daughter he ends up adopting. He confronts him again in the sewers under Paris where he's carrying the wounded body of his soon-to-be son-in-law to safety. The two pass like ships in the night over and over again in this show while Javert waxes poetic about how this man cannot possibly be allowed to roam free. He sings this song, there out in the darkness, a fugitive running, fallen from God, fallen from grace. God be my witness, I never shall yield till we come face to face. In fact, his inability to apprehend Valjean and enact whatever divine justice Javert feels he deserves ultimately drives Javert to throw himself off of a bridge. It drives him absolutely mad. Javert believes deep in his heart that this man is nothing but a criminal who deserves nothing but the harshest the law can possibly hand down. And this unrelenting bitterness sends him plummeting to his own death. I thought of Javert this week because, not because Jonah is a member of the French military or because he throws himself off a bridge or because he wears a fun hat in act two. I, I was reminded of Javert because similarly, Jonah has some internal issues that he is working out uh, regarding the people of Nineveh. Y'all all probably know the story that precedes this. Pastor Brandon just mentioned it a few moments ago. Jonah is told to go to Nineveh. And he not only says no, but he says heck no. And so he gets on a boat with a bunch of fishermen, and then this big storm comes up. And uh, the fishermen discern that Jonah is the, the person who is causing this storm. And so they throw him overboard. They were heading to Tarshish, which is like in the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. 
So the storm brews, Jonah gets thrown overboard, and you all know what happens next. Who did swallow Jonah? A whale, yes, a whale, or a big fish. I don't know, I'm not splitting hairs. But Jonah has some time to think about what he did <laughs> while in the belly of the whale. And again, God calls him to go to Nineveh after the fish coughs him up on the shore. And this time, Jonah goes. Smart man. And it's here where our story picks up for the day. Whether or not you believe Jonah was swallowed by Shamu, you have to admit that, this is one, that he's one impressive orator when he gets to Nineveh. He walks into this very large city, large enough that it takes three whole days to get across by foot. And by the end, he's convinced the king to make a royal proclamation. That's some serious preaching going on. And Nineveh goes from a city mired in all kinds of lawless shenanigans to a city that is clothed in the garments of repentance. I mean, I can't say that I've ever had that effect on people. Uh, I go to Franklin Street and almost get run over, and nobody is listening to anything I have to say there. <laughs> God sees the people's genuine contrition and forestalls his wrath. And roll the credits, they all live happily ever after. Not quite. Just kidding. Not Jonah. You'd think Jonah would be pretty thrilled. He went, and he warned, and everybody listened. Great outcome. No one's going to get smited by God Almighty. But Jonah is livid. How dare God let these people off so easy? How dare God change his mind? How dare God not enact the law to the fullest degree? These people are sinners, wicked in every way, hedonistic idol worshipers who didn't give a flying flip about the God of Israel before Jonah wandered in, covered in whale spit. And now God is going to let them off the hook because they said sorry nicely? In the most dramatic fashion ever, Jonah says that he would rather be dead, that he knew that this would happen because God is slow to anger, gracious and compassionate, abounding in steadfast love and whatever. Jonah didn't want to proclaim the good news to the people of Nineveh because he didn't think that they deserved it. I mean, I can even kind of imagine Jonah rolling his eyes as he's spouting off all of this to God. And God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be mad about this city? And we don't know what Jonah answers or if he even answers this question before he sulks off to the countryside where God provides him a nice leafy vine to shield him from the summer sun. We know something about the hot sun, do we not? <laughs> I take the dog outside and am practically dragging him into a shaded spot underneath the tree so that we do not spontaneously combust. This plant is a lifesaver for Jonah. It's a gift, a true respite from the punishing heat of a Middle Eastern summer. And God, always the good teacher, sends along the very hungry caterpillar. And poof, the vine is gone. But what's worse, he not only sends along the caterpillar, but he also opens the front door to hell and sends a blast of scorching, searing hot air in Jonah's direction. And Jonah once again proclaims that he just wants to die. Jonah would have made a great theater kid, by the way. And God asks him, who are you to care for this plant? Is it right that you who didn't plant it? who didn't tend to it, who didn't water it or prune it, should be mad about this plant? And again, God the good teacher lays before Jonah a metaphor. If Jonah can mourn the loss of this plant and be concerned for its existence, then all the more reason for God to love the people of Nineveh and care about their existence. This is such a beautiful illustration of one of the many functions of prophetic writing. Um, in the pastor's Sunday school class, uh, some of our conversations have been about the function of Scripture, as in what, what does Scripture do? Because amazingly, Scripture does a lot of things. I know we've said it before, but the Bible is kind of like a big library, a sort of anthology of sorts, of, of all different kinds of genres of law, of history, of wisdom, of major and minor prophets, and gospels and letters, and they all serve important functions. And they all kind of do slightly different jobs. And prophecy is perhaps one of the stickiest. Because for the longest time growing up, I felt that prophets were kind of like fortune tellers or soothsayers, able to see into the future and to predict things. 
And while some of that is perhaps true, um, I came to realize that prophets were wise and discerning people of God who were able to assess the situation rightly and see with their wisdom uh, what was going to happen in that situation, where it was going, unless something else caused it to stop. Amos is one of my favorites for this, um, very much so cause and effect to some extent. Um, for the exploitation of the poor and the hoarding of resources, Amos prophesies that God will crush the people like a cart that is overloaded with grain, is pressed into the ground. Which you can gather from that, if you hoard for yourself off the backs of others, you will be crushed by your own possessions and burdened by them. Do X and you get Y to some extent. And Jonah is a somewhat neat and tidy example of this. Through God's divine wisdom, Jonah can see where Nineveh is heading if they continue along their merry way. And he brings them a word from God, and lo and behold, they repent. They didn't do X, so they didn't get Y. Probably the best outcome imaginable for a prophet. Though, in this instance, strangely enough, it's not for Jonah. So why include Jonah's little tam temper tantrum at the end? Um, everything in the Bible serves a purpose, everything matters, context, content, all of it. So there is a reason that it's in here. And uh, why, was it to paint him in a bad light? Was it uh, the effects of the whale vomit messing with his brain? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know for sure because I was not there when the compilers of the Bible decided to keep it in. But I do wonder if this story is about more than a reluctant prophet bringing a whole city back to God. Not before getting eaten by a fish, mind you. I wonder if it's more than mere obedience, because if it was about Jonah learning how to obey, they could have stopped the story right at the end of the king's speech, and all would have been great. To me, this story is a stark reminder that the economy of grace that I operate under is not the same economy of grace that God employs. I just want consequences. I want rewards and punishments that suit the action and assuredness that the guilty will be punished and the good will be celebrated. I want an eye for an eye. When someone does something horrible, I want them to experience the consequences of their horribleness. I want vengeance. <laughs> I want retribution. Maybe I should play Javert the next time Les Mis is touring. I have personal experience in this. And maybe you do too. Because I'm not sure that this story was really about Nineveh at all. I think it was about God displaying his vast way of caring for his humanity, his mysterious way of changing his mind, and his loving way of giving second chances, and his infinite patience for Jonah, for the Jonas of the world. Okay, Nineveh is a wicked city, but Jonah was a self-important yet cowardly prophet at the beginning of this story. And like Javert, he didn't want grace or leniency, he wanted revenge. But interestingly enough, our God does not seem to be a God of revenge. Several of you in this very room have told me that you don't like the God of the Old Testament. I hate to break it to you, but that's the God that we've got. <laughs> we don't have a new one. <laughs> Are there problematic things in the Old Testament? Absolutely. God sanctioned genocide, racism, murder, sexism, and the gift get list goes on. But a reminder that the book of Jonah is in the Old Testament. And, and here we are. God changed his mind. God forestalled his smiting. God loved the world so much that he spared it more than that wilted vine, more than divine retribution. God loved more than he sought revenge. And that's not an easy thing to wrap our human brains around. It's easy to make fun of Jonah. He can be a little dense. It's easy to hate Javert. He can be a little mean. But that's us isn't it? We can be scared and stubborn and angry with the best of them. We can be mean and vindictive and self-righteous and as though we are the ones who stretched out the heavens ourselves. We are a fickle, stubborn people. We love what is right, and that is good. Please hear me. Please love things that are good and right. The church does not have enough bail money for all of you. <laughs> but in our pursuit of Christian perfection, and of holiness, and of Christ-likeness, we start to look a little bit like Jonah, cursing God under the droopy leaves, baking in the hot sun. We are fast to give out penalties and slow to give out second chances. 
And when someone does get a second chance, I don't know about you, but sometimes I narrow my eyes and furrow my brow, and I'm just waiting for them to mess things up again to show me that they were not worthy of that second shot in the first place. And that's not God's economy. That's my economy. That is my small, angry, scarce economy. And God doesn't work in scarcity, friends. God is in the business of abundance. Abundant second chances, abundant opportunities for grace, abundant love for the prodigal who comes home covered in pig mud, or in this case, in whale spit. And God loves Jonah enough to show him just how wide and deep and high that love goes. It's big enough for the entire city of Nineveh, all of their wickedness and hooligans included. And it's big enough for Jonah. It's big enough for Javert and Valjean. And most importantly today, it's big enough for us. As we uh, wrap up, back to Les Mis, I can't help myself. Um, before Valjean dies from singing his very high note, um, he and the spirits of two other characters sing a trio as he's passing uh, from this life into the next. And the last line they sing together goes like this. To love another person is to see the face of God. I have to believe that's God's ultimate goal for Jonah in this strange assignment, that he was to learn to see God's face in the faces of the Ninevites. And by extension, we too are called to see the face of God in all who we meet. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, it is a good thing that we gather around this table and are reminded that the risen Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live in peace with God and with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another using our prayer of confession. Merciful God, you find us sitting under the vine of our own bitterness, deep in callous thought, wondering how such a great God can be so forgiving and compassionate in the face of our enemies' wrongdoing. We are so fast to forget the graciousness you have shown to us quick to move on from the love you have lavished upon us, and slow to share that same love and grace with others. Forgive us, heal us, open our hands, and extend them to your broken and hurting world. Amen. Having confessed corporately, we now offer our individual confessions in silence. Amen. And friends, hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we prepare to receive our offering this week, um, just think about this fall and everything that is going to be kicking off. It's hard to believe that summer is almost over. I don't know where it went. Like just yesterday, we were saying, oh, good, summer's here, and now it's gone. And what a fun and wild summer it has been. But as we look toward the fall and look toward all the wonderful programmatic things um, that we're doing here at Christ Church, um, I'm so thankful for your generosity and to make those things happen during a worldwide pandemic and now as we're coming out of it. Um, we are just so blessed beyond measure to be such a generous congregation. Let us pray as we prepare to receive the offering. Generous God, from your hands you give us everything. You give us the leaves on the trees. You give us the sun that is shining upon our faces. And we give you thanks even in the midst of this very hot summer for all the ways in which you care for us. We bring you now a portion of that which you have given to us that you may take it and use it throughout the world that all may feel your love this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
standing as we gather around this table, a table in which all are invited, the Ninevites, the Israelites, and us this day, and we join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed be your name, Father most holy, for your steadfast love endures forever. You called Israel to be your child, and out of Egypt you brought forth your son. When Israel turned away and they refused you, your compassion grew warm and strong over your anger. You led them with cords of kindness and wrapped them in bands of love. Because you could not withdraw in your great mercy, you sent your infant son, eternally begotten of you, not only for the children of Israel, but for all whom you would embrace as your daughters and sons. By his sacrifice, you turn toward the whole world in everlasting love. And so we give you thanks with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, joining in their unending hymn. Inexhaustible God, you have not stored up treasure for yourself, but instead have been rich toward us. You did not keep your son in heaven, but sent him among us to share your boundless inheritance of grace. Send now your spirit upon your church, that grace freely received may be freely shared. Sanctify this bread and this cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of your son, who at supper with his disciples took bread and gave you thanks, and broke the bread, and gave it to them and said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, and again he gave you thanks, and he shared it with his disciples and said, take and drink of this, all of you. For this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And we proclaim now, great is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. In Christ, you make a new family of faith, where there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. Revive your church in the very places where human differences threaten to keep your disciples divided. Whether your church is in dispute with itself and your disciples are in conflict with one another, 
Stir our hearts to repentance. And give us humility to discover what love means. And open our imaginations to the life made possible by you. Renew us all and all of creation in your image until the day when Christ is all in all, trinity of love and power, one God, now and forever. Amen. now as the children of God, we are bold to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. This bread which we break is a sign of God's love for us all. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in God's grace poured out for all. Friends, as we say every week, but especially this week, this table does not belong to the United Methodist Church. It doesn't belong to Christ's United Methodist Church. This table belongs to Jesus Christ. And with Christ as our host, all are welcome who wish to partake in God's love and grace for them. We have two ways of communing today. We have the center aisle. You'll see a basket with communion elements in it. Those are prepackaged. You can take one of those and head back to your seat and commune in that way. We also have two stations here at the front um, where you'll come forward. A pastor will take a piece of the bread, will dip it into the cup, and then hand it to you for you to commune in that way. As we finish preparing the feast, I invite our ushers to get into place, and all will be made ready in a moment.
and let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And friends, I invite you to stand in body, mind, or spirit as we join in singing our closing song, Father, Let Your Kingdom Come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Father, let your kingdom come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Father, let your kingdom come. May the works of my hands bring you joy. May the works of my hands bring you joy. May the works of my hands bring you joy. May the works of my hands bring you joy. And we sing hallelujah. Before we go, just a couple of announcements, not very many. Um, as I said, Pastor Ben's on vacation, Dr. Dan's on vacation. We'll pray for their safety and their safe travels as they come back to us next week. This afternoon at 1 o'clock is our uh, church council meeting on Zoom, so if that affects you, that is happening. Just a friendly reminder. Um, and friends, um, of course, as we go into this fall, be on the lookout um, in our e-blast and various things for stuff kicking up. We're going to be getting going here again soon. I pray you all uh, remain safe, uh, wear your mask, do all that good stuff, so that way uh, we will all see you back here next week. And friends, hear this benediction. Um, we, we may fancy ourselves sort of those who can en enact divine judgments on people, and it may trouble us deeply when we feel like people don't get the consequences that they deserve. But I do pray that at the end of the, at the, end of the day, we're a little more like Jean Valjean and a little less like Javert, proclaiming to the world that to love another person 
is in fact to see the face of God. Go forth to love each other well in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.